Hello, my name is Michael Llewellyn, and this is a talk on Ethereum hacks and how to stop them with Open Zeppelin. Uh, this is a re-recording of my talk for DevCon 29, uh, and I hope all of you watching this virtually will enjoy it just as much as the people that did in person. Uh, so without further ado, I'll go ahead and get started. So uh, the agenda that we're going to go through is just going to be about a 60-minute talk, probably a little less since we won't have Q&A. Um, uh, since this is a virtual talk, uh, the introduction will be going over my story in blockchain, how I got here, um, a little bit about Open Zeppelin, which is the company I work for, and a lot of tools we'll cover will be Open Zeppelin based. Um, some of the Ethereum security case studies we're, that we're going to go over are going to talk about Ethereum hacks that we've seen in the space. Uh, some of them old, some of them new. Um, we'll reflect on the, what these incidents made possible, what we learned, uh, what the community ended up uh, coming to agreement on, and then uh, explain how we now can prevent these incidents using tools with Open Zeppelin. So without further ado, let's get into it. Uh, so first of all, my uh, story in blockchain started out in uh, mining. I was actually uh, in school when I first learned about Bitcoin. Uh, so I started mining on school computers, made a little extra money, um, got very interested in it at that point because I suddenly learned how to print money with a computer. So naturally I got uh, very curious, went down the rabbit hole of, of crypto economics and uh, technology and everything that was just fascinating about the space. And uh, once I started getting into it, I started to actually go to local meetups here in Dallas, Texas, and began consulting professionally as soon as I started to meet people that wanted to learn more or needed help setting up miners or doing security on their wallets. That was the sort of thing that I ended up providing as a service. And so once we once that happened, you know, I did some traveling. You can see me here at the, the Bitcoin Center in New York City before I got the beard and uh, been basically in the blockchain space ever since. Uh, so over time, uh, I started to learn more about uh, other applications for blockchain beyond just money and Bitcoin. Um, I still very much love Bitcoin, but I also saw the need for things like smart contracts and Ethereum uh, ended up coming out around the same time that I was studying for my computer science degree. So as I was learning computer science, I also started to learn how to program uh, smart contracts on Ethereum uh, and then started to do that professionally as well as a developer. So I did some startup work, uh, worked on some ICOs as well as some startups doing supply chain here in Dallas. Uh, and then eventually started to also do some corporate consulting. So I worked at Thomson Reuters doing tax accounting, uh, did some supply chain at Toyota using uh, an Ethereum blockchain, and then uh, also did some consulting at Verizon on some high culture fabric instances. So got, got around a lot, did a lot of work in the blockchain space, both startup and corporate. Um, and during that whole time, I was using Open Zeppelin contracts. So this is a library we'll talk about more in detail. But as I learned more about it uh, in the last year, I actually ended up applying to work at Open Zeppelin. Uh, after doing a lot of consulting, I wanted to work at a single company and uh, Open Zeppelin uh, luckily accepted. So I joined uh, the team this year as a project manager for their security services team. And uh, you can see a, a picture of us there at a retreat uh, in Mexico recently where we all get to meet in person for the first time, or at least I did. Um, and then, so in addition to Open Zeppelin, I've also been working in the space uh, as a lecturer at UT Dallas teaching a blockchain course. And then I've also been doing some public policy work with the Texas Blockchain Council, trying to uh, basically help the Texas government uh, make blockchain technology easier to use and, you know, clear up regulatory uncertainties and things like that. We've passed some laws in, in the recent months, uh, got some good traction going, and hopefully that will continue. Uh, but we're here to talk about security. So without further ado, let's talk about Open Zeppelin and the work we've been doing. Um, you can see we've worked with a lot of companies in the space. We've been around for years, uh, worked with Coinbase, Compound, Aave. I uh, continue to have a, a lot of relationships with these customers, either using our products or uh, auditing services. Um, so uh, I think we're very well known in the space. And uh, this is going to be a talk that gets into more detail on like, you know, how, how our products and services are really reflected in the systems. Uh, the hacks that have occurred and the ways that we've addressed them. Uh, so without further ado, let's get to the actual tech, the hacks, the, the reason that people come to DEF CON to learn more about um, what are these vulnerabilities and how can you protect against them. Um, so the DAO hack is the first big out. It's the first real instance where we learned that uh, security on smart contracts is not going to be easy. Uh, and in fact, it can be quite destructive if not done well. So uh, many people know about the DAO, but for those who might be new to the Ethereum space, uh, the DAO was an early set of smart contracts built for crowdfunding Ethereum development projects. Um, for those who might not know even about Ethereum smart contracts, um, these are essentially pieces of code 
that res reside on the Ethereum blockchain. And uh, Bitcoin, you know, people move money around using private keys. You have a public key that kind of corresponds to your, your wallet address, and you have a private key that you alone control, and that lets you send money back and forth. Uh, well, smart contracts actually let you do that with code. So instead of there being a private key that controls uh, funds, there's actually uh, a bit of code that determines how those funds are going to be handled. So you still have a public key, you have a, a public address that corresponds to a smart contract, uh, but the, the code will actually determine how funds that are received uh, are handled and then potentially sent elsewhere. Um, so you can use these smart contracts to do things like escrow uh, or even manage uh, a large amount of money uh, for a kind of decentralized organization. So the DAO stands for Decentralized Autonomous Organization, and its purpose was to be kind of a venture capital um, suite of smart contracts that helped uh, fund development projects in a way that was kind of like uh, crowdfunding with Indiegogo, but with uh, a decentralized nature to it. Um, and so this attracted a lot of investment and ended up acquiring millions, you know, millions of dollars of Ethereum was deposited in these smart contracts. Uh, and that ultimately led to it being quite a large honeypot. And so on July 17th, 2016, uh, the DAO suffered a hack that resulted in the loss of 11.5 million Ethereum Ether, uh, or $50 million. And the attacker was able to achieve this by exploiting multiple vulnerabilities, including a reentrancy bug that let them recursively call the smart contract and pull out funds repeatedly before the balance was actually updated to reflect the initial withdrawal. So this basically let them bleed the contract dry, and they were ultimately able, they were, you know, the funds were locked up for a little bit. And during that time, um, this caused quite a stink because this was a significant amount of Ethereum uh, it, at that time. So there was actually a decision by the community and the Ethereum Foundation team to effectively fork the protocol and use that fork to return the funds to the user and essentially reverse the hack. Uh, unfortunately, this was very contentious and uh, a lot of people in the Ethereum community were not happy about this because it kind of went, goes against the core tenets of the blockchain to be censorship resistant for transactions to be final. Um, and this split led to a fork uh, of Ethereum Classic, which was a uh, version of Ethereum where the hacks were not reversed, it stayed the course, and um, that community continues to this day as, as a separate split off. And so um, that, did, that did cause a lot of issues, but the, it, but the, the hack was reversed on uh, the main Ethereum chain or the, the chain that most people recognize as Ethereum today. So to give you an example of what this really looks like, what is an re-entrancy bug? Um, let's look at this example. So you can see this contract as a kind of, kind of an example of what happened. It's a simplified version of the DAO where you have this withdraw function. Um, and if you look at it line by line, you notice that the first line um, is just going to check the balances of uh, the message.sender, which is the person calling that function. So it's basically saying, um, you know, is the amount that they're trying to withdraw um, lower than or equal to the balance they have in the smart contract? Um, and what it will do is if that condition is correct, it will then call that smart contract through the fallback function, which is important, um, and send that value to the contract. And so what's important about this fallback function is you're effectively giving control um, to whoever's calling the smart contract. And if it's another smart contract, then that smart contract can actually execute code um, against the original victim contract. So to show you an example of that, um, you know, let's say that we called it with this attacker contract, and then the attacker contract's fallback function is then triggered when the funds are received. Um, and because you notice that the balances at the uh, bottom of the victim contract is uh, decremented, so the amount is withdrawn from their balance after the amount is sent, um, if you are able to essentially call the withdraw function before it returns to decrement that balance, then you can actually call the withdraw function again. So it goes to essentially, um, you know, the attacker contract recalls the withdrawal function. Once again, it goes through and checks the balance and the balance hasn't been updated. So it thinks it still has an amount to withdraw. Uh, and then the funds are sent to the attacker contract. The attacker contract then again calls the victim contract. And this essentially repeats until the funds are, are blood dry. So this is a, effectively how the DAO uh, was, was hacked with this reentrancy bug. So what were some takeaways from this? Um, Really, this was this was monumental. This was a, a massive hack on the Ethereum space. Where, um, you know, prior to this, I think smart contracts were kind of seen in a uh, a, a rose-colored light of uh, well, it's on a blockchain, therefore it must be secure. But what we did learn is that ultimately, smart contract developers need to write that code securely. 
uh, you know, logic bugs are going to be immutable if you do actually deploy that onto a blockchain. And you also need to account for malicious calls from external contracts and accounts. So even though, you know, if we look at the code for the DAO on its own, it seems secure. It seems to be accounting for the balance correctly. We're not accounting for the fact that reentrancy and other external calls can potentially uh, do things that are not expected. Uh, so ultimately, there needs to be a lot more considered with a smart contract rather than just the code itself. Um, we also learned that when you update state and balances, you should do it before you send funds or perform external calls, because if those external calls do something you're not expecting, then the balance, uh, you know, they might be able to do more things that the balance uh, should be updated prior to. So, you know, that was another big thing we learned. So make sure to update your balances prior to sending funds. Um, we also learned that forking a protocol um, in this case is, is possible to reverse an attack. You know, that is an option. Um, but it's it's not a great option. It can heavily damage the community and the platform's reputation for censorship resistance. So it's something that really should be a last resort, and the Ethereum community has not done a hard fork like this ever since. There have definitely been calls for it when other hacks have occurred, um, but this is really kind of a one-and-done thing. We haven't seen any other uh, community hard forks to address a, a hack, um, you know, any time after this. And I think that's probably for the best because it does come with a lot of risks that that becomes a more common occurrence, uh, which would potentially um, reduce the censorship resistance of that protocol. Um, and then finally, but of course, uh, we need better security standards and more secure solidity implementations to prevent these exploits. So a lot of this code um, that we that are that is being written uh, ultimately needs to have a higher level of security standard that needs to go through checks and tests. And most importantly, um, we need to use implementations that are already battle hardened right, to try to write our own code. So uh, how can we do this? Well, we can use the Open Zeppelin Contracts Library. Um, this is a battle tested open source library of smart contracts on Ethereum um, or for Ethereum and other EVM blockchains uh, that is available on GitHub um, as well as our website and many other places and as an NPM package. So um, really what this is, is it's just a way to say, hey, if you're gonna create an ERC20 token, uh, for example, or 721 token, um, you're going to want to do that with the set standard instead of trying to write that implementation yourself and, and open yourself up to make a mistake. So there, there are hundreds of thousands of smart contracts out there. Well, I don't know about hundreds of thousands. There's a lot of smart contracts out there. Um, the vast majority of DeFi projects, for example, um, use the standard uh, of code and use the smart contract implementation, uh, primarily because it's so battle hardened that there's an expectation that it's already secured. Um, in addition to that, you get additional functionality. You can make your, your tokens possible. You can create snapshots uh, and a lot of other extensions that are available um, kind of as, a, as, a, as an add-on uh, that are very simple to use. Um, you can also add in proxies for upgradability and cloning that makes uh, you know, upgrading your smart contracts possible. So if there is an issue that comes up with your smart contract or you want to make a change, um, you know, smart contracts are immutable by default. There's no built-in functionality to Solidity or Ethereum to upgrade your contracts, but we do have logic that makes it possible. Um, we also have the ability to provide access control. Who owns the contract? What roles can people play in uh, minting tokens or burning tokens or pausing tokens? There's, you know, you can create a whole access control paradigm using a lot of our contracts. Um, governance, which is kind of an extension of access control. People can uh, have time locks on certain functionality. You can have uh, potentially even the ability to create governance protocols, uh, compound governor, uh, like the compound protocol is something that we're implementing right now. Um, we have utilities, you know, basic stuff, cryptography, math, um, create two, which lets you do deterministic um, generation of smart contract addresses, data structures, things like that, uh, and upgrade plugins, which just help you do upgrades uh, directly to the smart contract through hard hat or truffle. Uh, and then finally, security module, which is the, the, the thing I'm getting to for uh, how we can address things like a reentrancy bug using uh, some some modules we've created specifically to ensure that you cannot be exploited by the same sort of bug that exploited the DAO. So to give you an example of this for preventing reentrancy exploits, we actually offer two options depending on what you're doing. Um, the first and the most simple is a reentrancy guard. It's essentially a function modifier that prevents reentrancy. So all you need to do is uh, put that modifier on your function. Uh, and whenever your, your function is called by an external contract, it prevents that contract from being able to call any other functions inside of your, your uh, smart contract. So essentially, it just makes reentrancy impossible. Uh, the other option that you have uh, in the case of payments, because in the case of payments, for example, if your contract, uh, if you're calling a contract that is, or rather you're sending funds to a contract that needs to uh, update any token balances, maybe that 
you know, balance resides on your smart contract. And there are cases in which they have to call your smart contract in order to handle that transfer. Um, we have a model called full payments and some modules to go with it. So it's essentially it's a reverse pattern of a push payment, which is uh, essentially what happens when you make a transfer to an external contract directly from your contract. Uh, in this case, rather what it does is it says, if you have a balanced draw, uh, it takes those funds and sets it aside in an escrow. And then that escrow can be withdrawn by that contract in a separate transaction. So essentially, um, because it's in a separate transaction, there is no possibility for reentrancy in that case. Um, and that's that's the advantage there. So that's that's a separate model that just provides better security against things like reentrancy. Um, so both of these are options with the contracts library, and there's a lot more details where that came from. Um, you can check out the blog from from Francisco that talks more about reentrancy after Istanbul and the the current modules that we have. Um, so that was the DAO, pretty pretty famous. But let's get into uh, an even messier hack, uh, one that really I think broke the assumptions that there are coders out there that can't make mistakes. Uh, the parity multisig hack that proves that no one is perfect. Um, so the parity multisig hack uh, occurred with um, Parity's multi-signature contract library. So Parity is a well-known company in the blockchain space. Uh, at the time, they had a Parity node uh, that was essentially an Ethereum node um, for for syncing with the blockchain, and the uh, the node came with the idea of a basically contract library that was multi-signature. So if there were funds that that node controlled, you would create a multi-signature library that allowed multiple keys to have control of those funds. Um, and this was all deployed as a smart contract on the Ethereum blockchain. And what this did is essentially it let users create their own multi-signature contract, um, but that contract would be dependent on a core library for its logic. So for example, you can see these two contracts uh, below, owner one, two, three, owner four, five, six, both have different balances, both control different funds, but the logic that they would use for deposits and withdrawals and many other things would all depend on this one uh, library contract that they essentially are dependent on. Um, and the reason for this is that you can save a lot of gas costs. You know, you don't have to deploy the same logic over and over again. Um, you can also let, you know, if that team wants to do updates to the library contract, it would automatically apply to the, the, the contracts that are dependent on it. Um, so you have a lot of advantages with this but uh, there are also some vulnerabilities. So an attacker was actually able to find a vulnerability uh, on July 19th, 2017, and stole uh, over 150,000 Ether tokens or $30 million uh, from three high profile multi sig contracts that were storing some funds from token sales. Uh, and so this was a very significant hack. The attacker was able to do this by obtaining exclusive ownership rights to each multi sig by calling an initializer function inside the library using delegate call. So I'll get into that in a little in, in a second in terms of the details of that. But basically, because of the dependency in the library contract, it was an exploit available. Um, so there was actually kind of a follow up to this. Uh, it wasn't a hack, but rather more of an kind of an accident, more like where um, they deployed a new library contract. Um, but there was a, a bug in that where anyone could call the self destruct function that would destroy the library contract. And that actually caused $150 million worth of funds to be locked up on November 6th when that, that function was called, uh, because all of the multi sig contracts out there that depended on the library contract for its logic no longer had the logic to do withdrawal. So the, the funds were frozen. Um, so this caused an additional loss on top of the initial hack. Um, so very damaging, and I, I'd recommend reading the postmortem from Parity below uh, to want more details on that. Um, but to give you an example of you know, what that hack looked like, and this is actually the code from the hack, um, summarized, uh, you basically have this library contract uh, and it contains an initialized wallet function that lets you initialize your wallet um, with the owners and requirements and time locks and things like that. Um, and the idea is that this should only be called once. It should only be called after the contract has been initially created and then no more. And that's the way it was, it was set up. Um, but if you look in the contract victim uh, and you see this fallback function there, um, you can actually see that there's a way potentially to call it again. Um, so if you go through, you can see that it initially has the logic to, um, you know, handle a deposit, and then otherwise, if there's no deposit or no value attached to that contract or to that payment, um, you see that essentially it says if there's any data contained in the, um, the function call, then the delegate call function will be called on the wallet library and it will pass that data onward. So basically it says if there's a function that I don't know about, um, you know, the contract victim doesn't know about, it'll pass that on to the library contract to say, hey, do you know this? Is this a function that you can handle, et cetera? Um, and the attacker could basically use this to call the initialized wallet function. Um, so he basically, you know, gave it 
he attacked his own address and then called the multi-site contract victim and it delegated that call to the library contract and allowed him to set his own uh, or him or her allowed him to set their own themselves as the owner of that contract. And that's essentially how this hack occurred. So it seems very simple, but it was missed because of visibility. It wasn't clear that the initial wallet function was visible to the contract victim uh, or rather the dependent contract, even though it really shouldn't have been. So what did we learn from this? So first of all, we learned that anyone can make a mistake because Parity was founded by Gavin Wood, who was the former CTO of Ethereum and the creator of Solidity and the EVM. So he, of all people, should be aware, you would think, of, of all the pitfalls of using Ethereum smart contracts. Um, it wasn't always clear exactly how involved he was, but he definitely, this was his company, his team. Um, he probably looked at the code at some point. So even the most reputable developers can ultimately make mistakes in these in this regard. So um, it was you know, definitely a great wake up call to say that you know, no one is perfect and we ultimately need to be able to uh, have, have processes and standards in place to make sure that you know, it, any developer can fail when you to catch that before something like this can occur. Um, the other thing we realized is that functions defaulting to public visibility um, are, are a serious issue. Uh, it can contribute to exploits such as this one. Uh, and so there's actually a change to Solidity in version 0 0.5, where now it's required that you specify the visibility for all functions. So it won't compile unless you say if it's public or private, so that at least it's clear. Because you notice, if I go back to this, there was no, uh, you know, function, there was no visibility modifier added to say what the visibility should have been for the unit wallet. So it defaulted to public, and then that made the attack possible. So uh, the other thing we learned is that complexity can definitely add to security risks. Um, so using libraries and delegate call can increase that because there, there are definitely more scenarios that can occur. Um, so it was trying to save gas, but that ultimately led to a vulnerability being possible. So it might be better to simplify your code rather than try to make it more complex just to save gas or optimize things. Uh, optimizations are still important. You should still do them as much as possible, but you should always know that there's a potential trade-off to security if you're, you're adding complexity to it. Uh, another important thing is that no bug bounty um, existed at the time to incentivize the reporting of critical issues. It's not clear if this would have prevented the hack, if the hacker would have uh, preferred to be paid by a bug bounty rather than do the hack. Um, but but we, we know that this has been successful in you know current times to catch a lot of bugs in production. Um, so ultimately, what we learned is that a bug bounty is is essential to catch it live issues. You know that was an option that might have prevented it. We're not sure, but it, it's one that should have at least been available at the time. Uh, and then finally, uh, another thing we learned is that audits are important and not just important, but, um, but, but, but need to be very clear and potentially need to be recurring. Um, there was a, an audit on the multi-sig wallet at one point, um, but changes had since been reintroduced before the attack. So it was very unclear which commit had been audited. Um, so it's really clear that we have recurring audits on code if it's changing over time, and that there's clear Git logs to ensure that um, we know what was audited and when. So naturally with Open Zeppelin, uh, we do security audits, and we definitely encourage uh, all of our clients to work with us on having a clean Git log to make it clear um, what was audited, what was patched, what PR, what commit. Um, so it's very clear to the community and to uh, future um, audits, you know, what, what should be considered potentially secure and what has not yet been checked. Uh, and we do these audits with many teams and many companies out in the world. And uh, we know that there's also a lot of other audit firms out there, and we would encourage uh, everyone to get audits, if not with us, then at least with someone. Um, another thing that we learned, um, or rather one thing that we are learning at Open Zeppelin is that there are limitations to audits, um, not because we're not good at our job, we feel very good at our job, but because we're ultimately, there's only so many of us and there's only so many auditors in the entire ecosystem. So uh, having a quality assurance process in place is still critical because ultimately um, the messier your code is, the more bugs that there are contained in it when we initially go through, especially if they're simple obvious bugs, um, the more time that takes away from us to do our job. And so we highly encourage all of our clients uh, and anyone in the industry, anyone deploying smart contracts to go through a rigorous QA process um, within your team uh, and build that in as a requirement for any code that goes to production or even goes into an audit. Uh, you should be doing this regardless of whether you get audits. You should still get audits, but you should absolutely have a QA process that catches as many bugs as possible before the audit even occurs. Um, so maintaining a disciplined Git workflow with a transparent log, uh, having pull requests that are approved and merged with clear understanding of what was changed and when, uh, very important. Um, having NATS, NATSEC uh, comments to all contract code uh, and keeping it clean. So we wanna make sure that we know, uh, you know what that code is doing, having an understanding of the arguments and the return values, uh, that makes it far easier to read. Uh, we want 
that you need to be documenting the architecture and relevant protocols. That's another thing that helps with an audit as well as any community members trying to understand uh, how to use the smart contracts correctly. Um, sometimes there can be bugs that occur, uh, not because the smart contract is has a bug, but because there are users that under, misunderstand how to use that smart contract and that causes a loss of funds uh, or other issues to occur. So documenting everything is crucial. Um, also running an exhaustive test suite is important. If you make any changes, you're able to test against that. Uh, it also makes it clear to both community members and developers and auditors what your code should be doing or what you expect it to do. Um, so having 100% code coverage or at the very least close to it, uh, another very important step that we we want to, you know, we, we would encourage a lot of projects and protocols out there to, to follow and uh, adhere to. Um, also using code libraries, you know, Open Zeppelin is, is obviously one of them, but there's also a lot of other, uh, you know, contracts out there that people commonly use, such as Compound, Governor Bravo, uh, or the, the uh, Gnosis um, uh, multisigs. And uh, we think it's important to try to import those as dependencies through NPM uh, or, or something similar rather than copy pasting the code, just because copy pasting the code doesn't make it clear what version you used. Or sometimes there can be bugs introduced. Um, so when you're auditing code, you have to take a closer look at that versus if you're pulling it from an external source that we already know and trust, then that always makes it easier to, to audit, cut down on time a bit. And it also just is, is best practice. Uh, and then finally, just having your own internal security reviews, you know, take time exclusively just for uh, digging into the code and making sure it's secure, uh, trying to break it yourself. Uh, so I think just having regular times where that's the only thing you're doing, or rather, you know, you finished a big implementation, just try to dig in and see if there's anything you missed that will really cut down the bugs. We've, we've seen a lot of teams that uh, will catch bugs prior to an audit that we start with them when they're, where they're giving more time to do that. Um, and then rug, run bug bounties regularly, like definitely have that available for um, the white hat hacker out there to uh, make money on uh, pointing out vulnerabilities in your code rather than opening the possibility for someone to say, well, I'm only going to get profit. I'm only going to get paid for finding this uh, by hacking it. Uh, you never want that to be uh, the only option they have. So definitely keep a bug bounty program out there. Uh, so with that being said, uh, let's stick into the uh, last hack we'll talk about today. This is a more recent one, the Yearn YDI Vault exploit. Uh, and this is a great example of flash loans and how they are coming for everyone's collateral uh, if you're not careful. So a little quick primer on flash loans. Uh, these are a new type of uncollateralized DeFi lending uh, protocols where liquidity is borrowed instantly and repaid in the same transaction block. So um, this is as opposed to uh, other uh, lending protocols out there where typically you need collateral. So for example, if I wanted to uh, you know, borrow some, some funds from MakerDAO, I would need to put up some Ether or other funds as collateral and then I can borrow against it. Usually it's, it's actually over collateralized. Um, but in this case, uh, what you can do with the flash loan is because it happens in the same transaction block, you actually get guarantees as a lender uh, that someone can pay you back. So for example, if a trader wants to flash borrow an amount just to make a trade, um, you can borrow that amount, make that trade to some sort of a DeFi protocol um, or, or, or DEX, and then you know, take some profit from that and then return those funds uh, plus whatever interest to that protocol all within the same transaction block. So the idea is that if anything happens along the way or anything could happen along the way that would make it impossible for the trader to repay their loan in full, then the transaction never happens or it gets reverted and essentially the, the lender has like a guarantee that they, they won't lose that money. So this is a really awesome tool uh, for traders and people that wanna use more financial products out there, but it also means that people have uh, a very powerful tool set in their, um, a very powerful tool to potentially make profitable hacks um, by, by conducting economic attacks. So this was first introduced by Aave in early 2020. Um, so this is still a fairly recent development, um, but it's definitely gained a lot of traction recently. There's other protocols that now support it. And uh, we now see a lot of exploits using flash loans. So this effectively what they'll do is they'll be able to borrow a lot of money and use that to manipulate on-chain pricing by you know unbalancing um, a pool or uh, a DEX and kind of messing with the pricing mechanism uh, by just having so much collateral that it, that it um, kind of overwhelms the protocol, kind of like just a, a whale attack, except anyone can be a whale with flash loan. Um, and what these can do is they can, you know, take out under collateralized loans as a result, um, they can trigger liquidations and then also increase the profitability of other exploits. So if they find an exploit that lets them, um, you know, but, you know, basically mess with the balance of the smart contract or something like that. Um, if, if they can unbalance pricing, they can potentially increase the profitability of that. 
Um, so let's look at this specific exploit with Yearn Finance. Uh, and, and Yearn is a lending aggregator. What they essentially do is they optimize token deposits with pools, uh, including the V1Y Dive Vault, which utilizes another protocol, Curve Finance, for its strategies. Uh, to, so to give you an idea of this, you have the Yearn Y Dive Vault, um, and essentially it's looking at the Curve Free Pool, which has three different stable coins in it, um, and it uses that to understand the pricing that it uses in its strategies, specifically in how it calculates deposits and withdrawals. So what the hacker was able to do is cause a loss of $11 million to the vault uh, while making a profit of $2.8 million by doing uh, several steps that uh, mess with the price and allowed them to make uh, essentially imbalanced deposits and withdrawals. So uh, essentially what they did is they just made those deposits and withdrawals at an unfavorable exchange rate. And after 38 minutes, the urine team was able to mitigate the attack by disabling deposits and saved about 24 million of the 35 million die. Uh, could have been a lot worse if they weren't able to do this and, and saw it immediately, um, but rather uh, it still caused a lot of damage. So for basically what the attacker was able to do, they were able to receive a flash loan um, from the lending protocol, um, imbalance three pool using that flash loan. So essentially causing a, a uh, imbalance that caused the price to be wrong. Uh, and then they made deposits into the urine wide die vault uh, and then a withdrawal and essentially, you know, got it at an unfavorable, unfavorable price. Uh, so to give you a, a better uh, breakdown of this, this was a diagram built by Steven from our uh, team. Uh, essentially, you can see the attacker depositing um, funds. So they essentially deposit uh, two of the stable coins and withdraw another stable coin tether um, that causes an imbalance. And then they deposit die into the victim vault. Uh, and because it's using the exchange rate from three pool, um, it does a deposit and uh, causes a loss. And then the attacker is able to do the deposit back in the three pool with the USDT they had originally taken out, withdraw the die from the vault at uh, another bad exchange rate, uh, and then withdraw the USDT in the last iteration. So essentially through the whole, and then, and then they do an exchange uh, on on M curve uh, to withdraw USDC in, in the die, and in the end they they've ultimately had a, a very large profit, and the victim vault has lost out. So you know this shows, you, and they were just able to essentially keep repeating this. I think they repeated it about five times uh, to to make a considerable amount of money. It could have kept going if if the vault had not been frozen. So what are some takeaways from this? Um, the first is that flash loans have very much changed the game by making economic attacks far more accessible. So prior to this, um, there were economic attacks that occurred, but they were kind of only available to whales in terms of actually like changing the pricing on exchanges or the exchanges just had very low liquidity. Um, so you know anyone could potentially balance it with a little bit of money, but now flash loans make it possible to do it uh, for anyone that can just do it within a single transaction block. So economic vulnerabilities in your protocol, like the ways that your you know, automated trading strategies could be broken by another trader, uh, are now almost as important as logic bugs because of the fact that someone could cause nearly as much damage uh, to your protocol as if they were able to, to break it directly and, and withdraw funds uh, in an unauthorized way. So um, definitely an issue that, that auditors and security teams everywhere need to be aware of. Uh, you also have dependencies on decentralized exchanges like Curve and other on-chain pricing, uh, basically opening these these protocols up to attack with flash loans and, and other ways. So we have these dependencies now in the DeFi space, uh, kind of like Legos, where everyone depends on each other for pricing or trading strategies. And so you have to really know the implications of using third party protocols, especially for on chain pricing. And so you need to consider using things like off chain oracles or, or multiple uh, aggregated oracle pricings to make sure that you're not dependent on just one protocol that could potentially be uh, manipulated. So definitely something to consider. Um, also, something with flash loans is that they're they're technically only viable for an attack if they are completed in one transaction block. So, um, while this isn't great because it definitely could cut back on the user experience by by increasing the time it takes to do certain transactions or or certain functionality, uh, consider multi-block flows for for sensitive functionality that you you don't feel is well protected against a flash loan or or something like it. Um, so, not a great option, but something to at least consider. Uh, and then finally, the attack was really only mitigated uh, by a quick response from the urn team when someone noticed that there was a complex transaction pattern occurring, uh, and ultimately that early, you know, that that early notice was able to save millions of die. And so what we're learning is that fast threat detection and response is critical for protecting using funds. Uh, we no longer can treat smart contracts as something where you know if you secure the code prior to deploying and then you deploy it, then you should be good. Um, you know, I don't think that was anyone's specific attitude yet, but I think this has shown that there, there really can't be any more 
um, complacency about, about uh, production code, even if it's a smart contract. You need to be watching that clearly and, and directly to make sure that you know, if there's an issue, you're, you can respond quickly. Um, so one thing that you can use to respond quickly is Open Zeppelin Defender. So this is a new product that has come out uh, for operations, automation, and secure app infrastructure. Um, it has both the UI and SDK. Uh, it provides teams a lot of options to secure their smart contracts and, and respond to, to issues. Um, so one, uh, a few of the features we have, one is admin, um, which is an interface for contracts administration. Um, you can bring your own keys if you want and use it to um, basically do a, a, a specific resolutions, do upgrades, do um, deployments, uh, anything that requires potentially a multi-sig or just, you know, you want to go through a clear process with your team to ensure that it's deployed correctly. Um, this is a great tool to do it. Uh, another thing we have is Relayer, which is a hosted key solution. Um, to ensure they're kept secure as well as doing reliable transaction delivery. So it's just a way to ensure that when you send a transaction, um, you're able to sign it securely and get it processed without worrying about specific gas issues or you know it not going through. You know, the relayer essentially handles that for you. So especially if it's an important transaction, like pausing a contract that's under attack, uh, you want to get it there as soon as possible and relayer helps do that. Uh, another thing we had is auto tasks. These are this is essentially serverless code for automated tasks and off-chain logic. So these can be uh, handling like specific things like, you know, updating your contract every day um, for specific things you want to do off chain or even responding to things directly that are uh, happening, such as a security incident. Uh, and then we also have Sentinels, which are a monitoring tool for monitoring transactions, events, and then triggering notifications and auto tasks uh, for certain things that occur. And then finally, we have Advisor, which is essentially a collection of our blockchain security best practices for you to look through and consider when you're building your projects. So let's take a closer look at Yearn and think about how we could have actually mitigated this even more. Um, so from the Yearn exploit postmortem, we saw that the opportunities to automate detection and mitigation steps for an even faster response you know, were possible. So um, you know, this is from the postmortem. You can see that the complex transaction pattern is what first piqued their interest and in, uh, caused them to, to jump into action and pause the contract. Um, so they were able to respond within 11 minutes, within 11 minutes of noticing the issue occurring, uh, which was probably about a little, a little over 30 minutes after the attack had started to occur, um, then they were able to respond. And so uh, what we want to see here is that, you know, the urine team did a great job responding, but what we would want to do is provide them a tool that lets them do this even better. Um, so there's a solution that Stephen Lander came up with in a Defender workshop recently that we did that you can see below. Uh, but to summarize here, uh, what we can do is we can take uh, the factors that they noticed me attack, you know, that the, it was a large complex transaction, which meant there was a lot of gas being used. Um, and there were also multiple functions being called all, all in the same transaction. There was an earn function, a withdrawal function, a deposit function. These are all things that uh, might cause you to worry, you know, if someone's doing deposit and withdrawal, then they might be doing that specifically because they're causing a trade imbalance, for example. Um, and we can also see that there was a loss of funds. We see that the balance is going down after each transaction and that there are probably a lot of funds being lost. Um, we can compare this from you know, this block to the previous block to see that this is not a normal occurrence. Um, so ultimately, these are all factors that you can use to take into account on how to uh, prevent this sort of attack. So looking at kind of a, a, you know, a solution that we can put together using Defender and the parameters we just discussed, um, we, can, we, we can basically take a step through each one of them. Uh, so like with the admin uh, tool, you can use that as an interface for contracts administration and use that to deploy a uh, Gnosis safe contract that lets you have a two out of three multi-sig arrangement um, and then use that to control your vault contract. You can do things like upgrade it or pause it uh, directly from this admin. So um, that's a great way to ensure that your team is able to securely respond to things um, with, with a clean interface or, or however method you prefer, whether you're using our key, you know, keys browsing for you or keys that you uh, have yourself. Uh, will work well either way. Uh, and then when you have that vault contract deployed, um, you want to be able to keep an eye on it. So you can use Sentinels to monitor the function calls and events. Uh, if there's anything fishy going on or if there's any specific events you want to know about, you can get notifications through email, Slack and Discord, Telegram, or even Datadog. Um, and if we want to, let's say, specifically look for high gas usage, um, we can trigger Sentinel um, to respond to that and notify it. And we can also have Sentinel invoke an auto task. Uh, so what auto tasks can do is they're either triggered by scheduler webhook or of course a sentinel um, and that can execute custom code such as a way to analyze the transactions occurring to determine hey are any of these factors matching uh, potential attack vectors so 
Uh, it can determine if there's a loss in the contract, if that's causing you know, the balances to drop significantly. And then it can send a webhook to the team uh, for an alert notification if the loss exceeds the threshold. And that team can then respond uh, manually by going to the admin panel and then you know, pausing that contract. Another way they could do it um, optionally is they can actually send the mitigation transaction through the relayer. Um, so doing so basically instead of even having to wait for someone to you know get online and press the button and pause the contract, you can actually let the system do it itself, where the relayer will send a transaction to the vault contract and pause it directly. So you have these two options for ways to respond to attacks. Um, and ultimately, what we want to do with the vendor is make it easier for people to have clear security operations that let them attack. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, respond to attacks quickly and effectively um, because time is of the essence and, and this is a system we think would, would definitely improve that and I know the urine team is now using Defender so we're hoping that definitely improves them as well. So in summary for this whole talk uh, what we've gone over are three major hacks and what we've learned so with the DAO hack we showed you know contracts can be broken from an external attack using reentrancy. Um, ultimately smart contracts are a new paradigm there's going to be a lot we have to learn security so Using simple modular code that's been battle tested and built with Ethereum security in mind is crucial. Uh, opens up in contracts is definitely a standard we believe in, but um, there are other contracts out there that also uh, are good to use in certain scenarios that are battle hardened. So better to use these simple systems that already exist rather than build it from scratch yourself. Uh, the parity multisig hack show that any skilled developer can make mistakes. Um, so we really need audits and bug bounties and an internal QA process to ensure that we keep the smart contracts secure. So there should never be a dependency on one person being smart enough to avoid a mistake. Um, we should have multiple steps in place throughout the process of, of building code and securing it prior to deploying it uh, to make sure that we're not gonna miss anything. And, and even if we miss something, we have bug bounties to ensure that if someone does uh, find the bug, they have a chance to report it and make money rather than hack and make money and the team is in a far worse position. So uh, you know, all these things we think are essential for any project that, that's handling millions of dollars. Uh, and then finally, the uh, urine wide evolved exploit, along with similar exploits, are showing the growing prevalence of economic attacks and flash loans. So we're just seeing a very, uh, you know, the attack surface is growing. There's more complexity involved with DeFi protocols than we're used to in the past. So uh, ultimately, you need to have operational security as well as kind of a post deployment security um, plan. So being able to respond to incidents quickly are it's going to be critical to mitigate these unforeseen attack vectors. So there's always going to be something you potentially miss. And having a way to respond to the things you miss and mitigate the damage, if not prevent it entirely, uh, is really crucial. And every team that's deploying smart contracts should be keeping that in mind uh, and using tools to protect against it. Defender is one option we highly recommend, but if you want to go with uh, building that code yourself or, or whatever um, you think is best, uh, we would encourage you to at least have something. Uh, we just see Defender as the best tool because we, you obviously have everything ready to go right out of the box. Um, so ultimately the attack service is growing smart contracts and you really need to be keeping an eye on how this complexity changes if you're going to be making deployments in this space. Um, uh, we have attacks frequently right after DEF CON there was a 600 million dollar attack with a uh, poly network uh, that's like kind of a, a cross-chain uh, protocol so I mean cross-chain interactions are a whole thing we didn't even get into in this talk but it's becoming a growing area uh, of potential attack. So ultimately, developers really need good security practice, both before and after deployment to mitigate these sorts of issues. Um, we'll, we'll probably be seeing more hacks in the future. And the best thing that every team can do is to ensure that they are covering all the bases possible. Um, learn from these past hacks, or at the very least, those aren't something you have to worry about. And for the hacks you, you know, can't foresee, being able to respond to them quickly is going to be the make the biggest difference. So uh, last but not least, just consider what we have at Open Zeppelin. Um, we have uh, contracts library that most people now use, um, but we also have an audit team that works closely with a lot of the best teams in the space to ensure that we have, uh, you know, they have secure code. Um, we catch bugs, we release reports, allow the community to read through them and understand them. Uh, and then we also have a defender uh, product that lets teams uh, manage their smart contracts securely and respond to threats quickly. So uh, that's it for this talk. Uh, won't have any, you know, questions here since this is virtual, but I do encourage you to check out Open Zeppelin after this. Um, you know, we have I have links here for contracts, our audits, our Defender tool. Um, we also have a jobs posting. We have plenty. We're hiring security engineers and open source developers to work on these sorts of tooling uh, and audit these sorts of projects. Um, we also have a forum where you can 
uh, ask security best practices, either about our tools or about uh, general smart contract issues uh, that you might have, and also read our documentation for more details on what we support. Uh, for example, Defender supports not just Ethereum, but Binance Smart Chain, Arbitrum, uh, Moonbeam, and many other EVM-based uh, blockchains out there. Uh, and then finally, if you have any questions or you just want to reach out, um, I'm available uh, at that email, LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, or what, you know, whatever you prefer. So uh, thank you for listening to this talk, and I hope you have a good day.